It wasn't pretty, and it wasn't beautiful, but it was a road ACC conference win. The Carolina Tar Heels are rolling. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? It's Monday, January 29th, 2024. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you, in particular, you everydayers, for being with us to get your Tar Heels content every single day. If that's not you, would love to invite you to come be a bigger part of the community. Join the Locked on Tar Heels Discord community, where we're hanging out, talking Carolina all the time. Come for the Tar Heels, stay for the people. It's free and available. The link is in the show notes. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more new customers. Join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. All right, we're talking about yet another Tar Heel victory, 75-68. Hey, I said it in the cold open. It was not pretty or beautiful, particularly down the stretch. But Carolina, yet again, executed and uh, allowed their veteran capability to make the plays down the stretch. They needed to another tough, gritty road win. Overall, Tar Heels are now 17-3, and 9-0 and in ACC play. You've heard me talk about it multiple times, but it's the first time doing so since 2000-2001 and just the ninth time ever, meaning they'll be looking to go 10-0 and as they head to Atlanta tomorrow night. And that would be just the eighth time ever the Tar Heels have done that. The 10 straight victories for Carolina is tied for second most in the nation right now. McNeese State is number one with 13. Uh, As I record this, Carolina is fifth at Ken Palm, 15th in offensive efficiency, fourth in defensive. And they, uh, when the net refreshed on Sunday, they were seventh, obviously recording this on Sunday. I don't know yet what it will be on Monday. I would imagine, um, since no slip ups from UConn or Purdue, they'll still be third in the AP poll. So, um, here's the deal. Here's where I want to start off is talking about Elliot Cadeau, because I feel like, you know, what you've got with a lot of other Carolina pieces, right? Like RJ, You just have come to expect 20 to 25 points a game, assist steals, great free throw shooting, all of that to, you know, multiple threes made Armando Harrison Ingram. I mean, you know, these things are changing a little bit, but you know, for the most part, what you have with them with Elliot, because he's a freshman, it's just this continual growth. And on Saturday, we got another glimpse of just how important this young man is to this team's ultimate ceiling. I think that's what we expected preseason, and it's proving to now be true. I love how invaluable he is, not just because of what he does, but because of how it complements everyone around him. And so that's my biggest takeaway from this game. The continued growth of Elliot Cadeau is maybe the single most critical part to Carolina making a Final Four or winning a national championship. And I don't overstate that in any way. And what was great about Saturday is his capability, his just continued growth was clear and evident right out of the gate. Let me give you some uh, just numbers to back that up. Carolina scored 13 points in the first three minutes and 49 seconds of the game. I'm not going to go all the way through it and like litigate each one of those, but you need to know that Elliot Cadeau either scored or assisted on all 13 of those points. Even beyond Elliott, if we look at the the combined backcourt of Elliott and RJ Davis, the two of them combined to score or assist on Carolina's first 19 points. And in the entirety of the first half, Carolina scored 36 points. Those two guys combined to score or assist on 28 of them. And just scoring alone, Carolina scored 75 points in this game. Those two guys, RJ Davis and Elliott Cadeau, combined for 40 of those. So, man, you just see this backcourt taken off and taking over. This is very, very encouraging to me. Why? Because if you've listened to me talk about college basketball for any length of time, you know how critically important I believe guard play is all season long, but particularly 
as you get into postseason play, be it the ACC tournament and particularly into the NCAA tournament. Again, you already know what you have with RJ, but now with Elliott doing what he has been doing, each game growing more confident, each game growing more aggressive, you start to feel like you now have a legitimate elite backcourt. The combo of RJ Davis and Elliott Cadeau, in my opinion, has controlled the last two games. RJ's controlled a lot of games this season, but now Elliott is rising to that level as well. And so the two of them have the capability to take over and control every game that Carolina plays in the rest of the season. And that's not hyperbolic of me to say. Now, one thing we do need to keep in mind, Elliott Cadeau is a freshman. You saw what happened to Purdue last year in the first round of the NCAA tournament. They fell to Fairleigh Dickinson. Why? Particularly because their all-freshman backcourt of Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer kind of tensed up and froze up. Is that going to be Carolina's reality in March? I don't think so, because I think Elliot Cadeau, with how he continues to grow in confidence, and I don't mean pride or arrogance, I mean uh, appropriately placed confidence, is such a good thing. And oh, by the way, here's the difference between Carolina and last year's Purdue. Those That was an all-freshman backcourt. Elliot, yes, is a freshman, but he is surrounded by senior R.J. Davis, by 25-year-old Cormac Ryan, by junior Harrison Ingram, and by fifth-year Mondo Baycott, not to mention, you know, the the guys coming off the bench and the experience they bring. And so I think that all mitigates what uh, Elliot's youth, because there's so much experience everywhere else, save Zayden High. Um, But you just, you know, and I don't mean this as any slight to Zayden. It's just this year, the Tar Heels don't have to rely on him that much. And this is a great thing when you can rely on getting old and staying old. Let me give you another example of Elliot's just sheer importance. You notice it when he's contributing, but you also notice it when he's absent. In the first half, Elliot picked up two quick fouls within 22 seconds of each other. It was like, 6.51 left and 6.29 left. Quick succession. Obviously, Coach Davis brings him to the bench because you do not want to miss that floor general for the second half or risk getting that third foul. So he sat for that final six and a half minutes. When Elliott Cadeau went out, the Tar Heels were up 28 to 25, so plus three. When the game went to halftime, the end of the first half, FSU now led 41 to 36. Quick math tells you with Elliott Cadeau on the bench, Carolina, or, uh, Florida State went on a 16 to 8 run. So you notice it not just in Elliott's production, but that production missing when he's not there. Is he perfect? Is Elliott Cadeau doing everything right? By no means. But guess what? Nobody is. RJ had his first four turnover game of the season on. So, you know, like everyone's going to have moments or games where they make mistakes. And so, like, you can't expect that out of Elliot. But for me right now, the 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 good is far outweighing a, a not as great moment. A, a perfect example of that from Saturday, uh, whereas you had that stretch of the second half leading to the under four timeout. Carolina was up five, had the ball. R.J. Davis missed a three. Armando Baycott got the offensive rebound, kicked it to Cadeau, who instead of pulling it out, resetting the offense... And oh, by the way, running clock immediately put up a long two. In that moment, 20 more seconds of burning the clock down to about 340 would have been a lot more integral for Carolina's success than getting up a long and inefficient two-point shot. And so that, and then the, the other issue is that led to Florida State getting a couple free throws. A couple possessions later, they got another bucket that cut it to two points. Instead, had Elliott pulled it out, Carolina might have been able to push the lead to seven or eight, and then that just changes that. So that was a moment of situational awareness. And here's the good thing. You don't look at that and you say, oh, Elliot, you bonehead. What? Oh, he's going to keep doing that. No, he's going to learn. He's going to learn from that moment, and it's going to be better. It's a mistake in late January that he will not make in late February or any time in March. Now, there are going to be freshman moments. You just have to live with that. But Elliot Cadeau is having great moments, and he's learning through the not-as-great moments. It's like he's finally realized, oh, man, 
this team really, really, I know they've been telling me they need me to be assertive. I know they've been telling me they need me to be aggressive and that I shouldn't just defer to RJ and Armando and Harrison and Cormac, but I really have to do that. And that's, that's why he came to Carolina a year early is to be the point guard for this old, great team. And it's like Elliot is finally understanding that and fully embracing it and leaning into it. They don't just want him to be the floor general. They need him to be the floor general. And that's what he is doing now. But what I love about this team, this is, it's not just about Elliot having to do it on its own. Clearly it's about all of them. This is a team that has now come back on Florida state twice this season from at least like both games this season, Carolina has against Florida state. I should say they have trailed the Seminoles by at least eight points in the second half and come back to win. The first time around, the deficit was as big as 14. It was 17, 15 to go. Carolina wins by eight. On Saturday, the deficit was, the biggest deficit in the second half was eight points. And that was with 18 and a half to go. Carolina comes back and wins by seven. At home, on the road, it doesn't matter. This team believes in themselves. They believe that they can come back from any situation. They believe that they're the better team. They believe that they're the most experienced team, but they just gotta keep executing. And that's exactly what they did. They trusted the process. And folks, hear me say this loud and clear. I watch a lot of college basketball because of my role, not just covering uh, the Tar Heels for Locked on Tar Heels, uh, but I also am the co-host of Locked on College Basketball. And so I'm watching as much of it as I possibly can. Hear me say this. There are not many teams in this country in Division I that would have won these two games. Most teams would have gotten down by 14 and eight and, you know, kept playing, but kind of packed it in and lost one or both of these games, but not these Tar Heels. They know how to win. They know how to execute and they did it. But hear me also say you have achieved nothing yet because Carolina, while nine and oh, could lose 11 straight and be nine and 11 heading into the ACC tournament. They're not going to do that, but you hear the, the thought behind it. So now you want to make these wins just keep being worth it. And so you got to go stack another win on Tuesday at Georgia Tech. One of the issues, at least in the first half of this game, were turnovers that plagued the Tar Heels, but they got it under control in the second half. Why was that important? And the rest of the Four Corners recap, all coming at you in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits to LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed or power or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with the eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So keep your ride or die alive with ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, let's get into our Four Corners recap and the shady stat of the game. For those of you watching on YouTube, you can see I've pulled up the box score. If you're listening, you might want to pull it up wherever you're at. So number one in our Four Corners recap, turnovers. They plagued Carolina in the first half. Now, you know, I'm a very glass half full kind of person. I'm always looking for the silver lining. It's just kind of my disposition. It's how I live life. If you're looking for doom and gloom, this is not the show for you. Um, But despite being a glass half full kind of person, I want to start Four Corners recap with a this needs to be fixed. Carolina had 17 turnovers in this game on Saturday. That ties a season high, uh, the the other time being in the game against Kentucky. The difference here is that Carolina was able to weather the storm and still win. Interestingly, 11 of those 17 turnovers were Florida State steals. That was the first time all season that Carolina has allowed an opponent to grab double digit steals. So there, there's something there to that. And, and it wasn't just one guy. I know I said RJ had four turnovers. 
Uh, but you know, multiple people had more Elliot Cadeau had three Harrison Ingram had three, uh, several other guys had two. And so that just is what it is. But let me say this 12 of the turnovers were in the first half. And remember we talked about how critical Elliot Cadeau is and, and how much he was missed on the bench, that final six and a half minutes of the first half, six, exactly half of Carolina's first half turnovers came in that final six and a half minutes when Elliot Cadeau was not in the game. Now, you you know that you've got multiple ball handlers, and that's so glad. Like, even when he's on the bench, you've got RJ, you've got Seth Trimble, you've got Harrison Ingram, you've got Cormac Ryan. But none of those guys, all due respect to all of them, none of them are Elliot. He needs to be in the game. Um, so that that's just an interesting anecdote from that moment as well. Um, silver lining. I guess I can't help but get to a silver lining. Only five turnovers in the seven half, in the second half, excuse me. And one of the things I had mentioned at halftime is, look, Carolina had been great for the first however many minutes of this game, building out a nice lead. But if you can't hang on to the ball, that means you're not getting shots up. And that means you can't score points. And that's how you win basketball games is scoring more points than your opponent. That's just how it works. Crazy, right? And so I just said, look, second half of this game, hold on to the basketball and you win. And that's what Carolina did. They cut down from 12 to five turnovers in that second half. But, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a trend Carolina needs to look at. This is now back-to-back Saturdays, back-to-back road games that Carolina has had trouble with turnovers in the first half in particular, but done a nice job in the second half cleaning it up. So I'm going to be watching intently uh, tomorrow night at Georgia Tech. How does Carolina do on the road with turnovers in the first half? Number two in our Four Corners recap, three-point field goal shooting. Man, Carolina went 8 of 21 in this game, 38.1%. That's not setting the world on fire, but it's, I mean, anything north of 35, man, I'm, I'm going to live with on a consistent basis. Cormac Ryan hit three. He's up to exactly 30% for the season. 30 out of 100. Want to see him just keep growing, stacking better shooting games. Let's take a big picture zoom out look at the three-point shooting really quick because I think right now it's easy, perhaps middle of the season, to forget what the past several years have been. In three of the past four years, Carolina has shot under 32% from deep for the season. And oh, by the way, Those are the three lowest three-point field goal percentages in Carolina history. That's been three of the last four years with the lone outlier being uh, Coach Davis's first season. That was the only time Carolina wasn't under 32%. Currently this year, the Tar Heels sit at 35.7%, 88th in the nation. That's great. I mean, obviously you'd always love to shoot better, but look, if Cormac, Ryan starts connecting at a more consistent rate, that number's going to go up and you love to see that. But here's why I want to bring up this big picture. Look at it. Every national champion of the three point era has made at least 32.9% of their threes. Furthermore, 30 of the 36 national champions in the three point era have shot at least 36% from three or better. Carolina, again, right now, 35.7%. So they're knocking on that doorstep of 36%. You'd love to get up to that um, because that just speaks a lot of Carolina's capability to uh, be a national champion because of those kind of characteristics. Number three in our Four Corners recap, rebounding. North Carolina wins that rebounding battle yet again. This time around, Carolina has 41, Florida State 32. Carolina had 16 offensive rebounds. That's just silly and ridiculous. 25 on the defensive glass. This is now nine straight games that the Tar Heels have out rebounded their opponent, all of them by at least seven rebounds. And in fact, that plus seven and this plus nine are the only two non-double digit rebounding margin victories in that stretch. Great stuff. Uh, specifically to offensive rebounding. You know, that was a staple of the Roy Williams era. It hasn't been as much in the Hubert Davis era. However, Carolina's offensive rebounding percentage in this game was 43.2%, the second best number all season. I also, in my statistical follow-ups, I I keep a chart, both of Carolina's total um, offensive rebounding percentage for a game and their field goal specific offensive rebounding for a game, meaning I just take out 
the offensive rebounding numbers on free throws and look solely at field goals. That number for this game was 47.1%. I bring that up because that was Carolina's highest field goal offensive rebounding percentage of the season. You love to see that. Oh, by the way, no, I'll, I'm going to save that little nugget here for just a minute. Uh, number four in our four corners recap is free throws. Carolina, once yet again, just takes big time advantage and sh makes more free throws than their opponent attempted. First half, Carolina was 10 of 14 at the line. You'd like to make a couple more than that, but you love getting to the line that much. Meanwhile, they held Florida State to just three attempts. They made two of them. So Carolina outscored Florida State plus eight from the free throw line in the first half. Second half, the attempts were more even. Carolina had 10 attempts, Florida State eight. But here's the massive difference. Carolina made nine of their 10, while Florida State made just three of their eight. So while the attempts were only plus two Carolina, the scoring was plus six Carolina in the second half at the free throw line. You will 100% take that every day of the week. All right, shady stat of the game. Man, I got to just keep going to this well. The Carolina defense, I am loving it, loving it, loving it. This is now the 10th straight time that Carolina has held their opponent to 70 or fewer points. And perhaps one of the more impressive moments of doing it because Florida State had 41 at halftime. And I was like, whoa, well, that's over. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a game where Florida State's going to get into the 80s. Carolina's going to have to score a lot to win. But Carolina held Florida State to just 27 points in the second half, meaning they finished with 68. Yet again, a team held to 70 or fewer. In fact, of Carolina's 20 games, they've held 15 opponents to 70 or fewer points. Just doing it on defense. I have just, way to go, Tar Heels. Now, a big part of that defensive in, uh, capability has been Armando Baycott and his senior leadership. He is a veteran, and he proved it in two very specific tangible ways on Saturday that I want to point out. And we'll do that in just a second. Right after I tell you that this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl. We're, about, we're two weeks away to all who celebrate. Coming to you from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, all the food, all the drinks, and placing some fun prop bets or whatever it is. In real time, as I record, the Chiefs have already won, but the Lions and 49ers are still in action. So here's your Super Bowl winner odds right now. Obviously, the Chiefs are the best odds because they're in the game. <laughs> Minus 150. Lions plus 220. 49ers plus 550. Obviously, by the time you're listening or watching this, you know who the opponent will be. Fan Day, FanDuel has so many different ways for you to end the season with a W. Not only can you bet on who will win the Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown, how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers, join today and you'll get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. All right, let's talk about Armando Baycott's veteran leadership. One quick nugget before we get there. Hey, you know what it takes to win a national championship? I mean, lots of things. But one of them is winning six straight games. That's just how brackets work. Not many teams are able to string together a six-game winning streak in the course of a season. Just want to remind you that right now, Carolina has won 10 in a row. I don't know what else will happen the rest of this regular season or even the postseason. But by virtue of doing this against a difficult schedule, Carolina will be one of the very few teams in the nation capable of winning a national championship. I just wanted to make sure you and I all keep that in mind. All right, Armando Baycott. Two specific moments I want to point out in this game that just showed his leadership and capability. There was a moment earlier in the game when Deontay Green from Florida State decided he wanted to get real chirpy, who's feeling himself, and he wanted to go at Mr. Baycott a little bit. You know what Armando did? Not really anything. And not in a like, oh, don't don't hurt me, Mr. Green. No, not in like he shied away from it. Just in like a, bro, I'm not going to be pulled into this. I don't need this. I got my eyes on bigger pictures 
than than you or what you're doing here. And so Armando, very much to his credit, just was like not having it. And I, you love to see guys like Harrison and, and everyone getting into it. But I love um, Armando's senior leadership in that moment. The second thing that I just really thought showed his um, maturity was the very end of the game. Carolina's up seven. Um, Carolina gets a pitch ahead up to Armando in the front court all by himself. Could have had a dunk to end the game. There's still six seconds left on the clock um, when that happened. But he showed the wisdom and veteran savvy to just know like, hey, this game's over. Florida State's not going to foul again. And he just pulled the ball out, the circled around, pulled the ball out and just held it till the buzzer went off. My man, Armando Baycott, chef's kiss to you. Senior leadership. And I know, folks, I know some of the stats are down in terms of scoring, rebounding, uh, 13.6 a game, 10 rebounds a game. But guess what? Man, those free throws are skyrocketing from what he's ever done before. 79.2%. He's currently got the best assist to turnover ratio of his career. He's currently got the best blocks per game average of his career. He's already surpassed the total number of blocks he had all of last season. He's currently fourth all time in blocks at Carolina, four away from becoming just the fourth Tar Heel to hit 200 blocks in his career. Armando Baycott is a critical key piece of this team that's going to keep delivering in a multitude of ways, and you love it. Harrison Ingram, good grief, my man, 13 points, 17 rebounds. A very efficient day from the floor, four of eight on field goals, three of four from deep, two of two from the free throw line, which is critical for a guy that's just not had a great year at the free throw line. What I wanted, that nugget I said I wanted to hold when we were talking about rebounds a second ago, how about this? Harrison Ingram had seven offensive rebounds by himself. No Florida State player had more than six total rebounds, offensive or defensive. So that's a, that. Here you go. Harrison Ingram had more offensive rebounds than any Seminole had total rebounds. (laughs) That's incredible. Not only did he do all that, but in one assist, three steals, and a block, critical block towards the end of the game, which, oh, by the way, was another thing that Elliot Cadeau set up because he was walling off defensively, allowed uh, Ingram to come over. How about our guy, RJ Davis? I, I just want to stop and think about all the three point shooting that he's doing still. He, um, you know, not a, a great, uh, three point shooting game by his standards in this one. I believe it was, uh, two of eight was his number. If I remember correctly. Yeah. Two of eight. He's still over 40% for the season, but for his career now, RJ has made 221 threes. That's tied with Donald Williams and Rashad McCants for fifth most all time. So he's going to break that Tuesday night, uh, at Georgia tech. Next up on the list for Carolina is Wayne Ellington in fourth place with 229. Single season, RJ right now has made exactly 60. That is an average of exactly three per game right now that RJ is making. At that pace, he'd finish the regular season with 93, which that already would tie him for sixth all time with Caleb Love and Joel Berry from the season after the national championship. Furthermore, at that three per game average, he would need just four postseason games to tie Justin Jackson for the most in Carolina history in a single season. RJ is having a special, special basketball season. I don't need to tell you that, but I just like to remind you. Quick ACC update. Carolina now has a three game lead over everyone not named Duke. Carolina nine and oh, Duke six and two. Virginia and Florida State, six and three. Obviously, Carolina holds the season sweep over Florida State, so that tiebreaker. And then Wake Forest is next at five and three, another tiebreaker that the Tar Heels hold. Love to see that. Quick weekend wrap up. Unfortunately, the women's basketball team lost to Virginia on Sunday, 81 to 66. Tough game. Cavs came in with a not great ACC record. So, Courtney Banghart's team going to have to rebound. Women's tennis. Surprise, surprise, sweeps Oregon and Kentucky over the weekend, qualifies for the ITA Indoor Championships, which will be in Seattle February 9 through 12. Tar Heels seeking their fifth straight indoor national championship. Crazy, crazy stuff. 
the men lost to Illinois on Saturday, three to four. Tough one, tough loss. Um, but they rebounded to beat number 20 Florida in the consolation round on Sunday. Wrestling lost at Virginia Tech on Friday, 33 to three, but they rebounded and beat Navy on Sunday, 20 to 17. Swimming, both men and women won at Duke on Friday. And gymnastics, unfortunately, lost to Clemson also on Friday night in Carmichael. So, a uh, pretty good weekend all around for the Tar Heels. Man, it's another great week ahead of us. Don't forget, uh, for men's basketball, it's at Georgia Tech Tuesday night, and you know what's upcoming Saturday, but we're not even going to talk about it because every game matters. We'll get there on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. We'll turn our attention. Friends, thank you for joining me to kick off a brand new week. It's been great to be together. Again, if you're not part of our Locked on Tar Heels Discord community, would love to have you come be part of that. The link is in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to Locked on Tar Heels on audio and video. If you're watching, the link's just down in the corner there. Smash the like button so we know you're here. It'd mean a ton to us if you would leave a rating and review of the show. That just helps spread the word. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We are flying high right now, right? I know you are because I know I am. We'll talk again tomorrow to get ready for Georgia Tech. But until then, peace.